I'm Scott Al Miller's the 30th of September 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today we have another house tour in the barrio of Saragossa. It's kind of a partner video to our one that we did yesterday where we went through a really large house that's located on the south side of the street. We're going to go right across the street and go to a house that is on the north side of the street and give you a feel of a completely different house in the same block. These are both owned by the same family and both have been featured from the outside on previous videos that I've done where I said I'd really like to tour these houses and the owners reached out and said yes come to come take a tour of the houses. We're also going to be answering a viewer question today. So we're going to get to all that right after the bump. the day by doing a tour of the house. Now, unlike the house yesterday, this is this is not what we would classify as a mansion, but I'm told that what this was, was a small, skinny, um, original city house, and the one behind it became available. And so they actually bought one right after another and, and made a double deep house. So you get a really long, narrow feel to this house. But it's really cool. The the front living room. Oh, my dog just came running out. But the front living room is very nice. It has a beautiful spot on the street. Of course, it has south facing light. So you can if you open up the front windows, you can get just loads of light. It's got a modern small kitchen. It's got a number of bedrooms and they have expanded to the second floor. So there's some areas that really get a lot of air and it's basically like an in-law suite type of arrangement. So that's an entire suite on the second floor, uh, which is handy for a lot of potential use cases. So before we do anything else, Let's start by bringing up a map of Saragossa. We talked about this a bit yesterday, so if you uh, are unfamiliar with the barrio of Saragossa, go watch yesterday's episode, even if you have not, uh, whatever, just go watch yesterday's as well. Uh, make sure you do watch that, um, support the show and all that. Uh, go watch that, and then uh, we're going to show a map so you see where we are and give you a feel. This is right in the middle of the city. This is very close to La Colonia, the grocery store. Great area for, for walking to things. All things we said yesterday, but a, a really good location. But the barrio is not super expensive. Uh, so Saragossa is uh, very nice for people who want to be in that downtown area with those amenities. It's a good safe area. There's no particular issues with it. It's very similar to La Barrio and Guadalupe. Uh, you do have the opportunity to potentially get quite good deals here while being close to the city center. So that's fantastic. What a great location. Let's go look at the house. All right, yesterday we showed you a house in Saragossa and today we're gonna do the one across the street. This is the same family. Uh, they have both, which is pretty normal uh, to want to, so we got this one. Facade in stone, very cute. We've shown it on the show probably three or four times uh, over the years, including yesterday. And uh, this is a much smaller house, but it actually has more bedrooms than the turquoise one. Blue, I, you know I'm colorblind, so we're doing our best. But so I'm standing at the one that we showed yesterday, and we're gonna head in here now. So this is a more modern house. It is a long, narrow structure, whereas this one is a very broad uh, on the street, the one we saw yesterday. So completely different uh, way that they lay in the neighborhood and interact, and this is actually two houses houses that were purchased and then combined front to back, which is a thing that gets done here, right? People grow their homes however uh, they're able to based on who's willing to sell next to them, behind them, whatever. So we're going to head in now. So the one we saw yesterday is empty because they're pre pre preparing it, but they're actually living in the one over here. So we're going to be uh, going into a full house. However, this one is also potentially available. So if anybody wants to talk about that, uh, we can connect you. But uh, here we go. We're going to step inside and we're going to let the camera adjust and I'm going to turn it around. Take you guys for a tour. Entering the house, we're going right into the living room or kind of sitting room right here. Very common in Nicaraguan homes. Have a place with rocking chairs to sit right in front. You got a little dining room just behind. It's just a big open space. And then the formal living room or salon right there on the side, all fancy and meant more for show uh, than for company. This is a very traditional Nicaraguan setup. Now notice this garden on the right. This is beautiful. We're going to see that in a second. Kitchen, very modern, normal small but very functional with the little tiny breakfast nook this is what you would expect in a modern apartment or a modern house so a little bit different here but a great kitchen that green room is fantastic now notice there's a lot of windows and doors in the front so if you want to open that up and be on the street you can this gives you a bit of being outside indoors that's an open top so a lot of air coming across there which you can open or close the back uh, brick wall goes into the master bedroom 
front into the living room and side into the hallway and then open on top. So a lot of air. This is the master. Not a large room, but it's very attractive. This beautiful open window onto the garden. So if you wanted a really secure master where you have that feeling of being outside, with beautiful light, you'll be able to have the windows open, but you are concerned about being open in the city or anything. This is great. Really a nicely done room. Uh, Built-ins there, of course. It's got that matching stone or brick wall to the outside. Unfortunately, this is really dark, but we're going to go past. There's a walk-in closet there on the right. This is the bathroom. Hopefully we find the light. There we go. And uh, nothing special as far as the bathroom goes, but a decent space. And we're going to turn around and head back out. We don't really get to see the walk-in. I didn't have the lights for that, but there is a pretty good size closet there on the left. And then you can see, I mean, and this master has a big bed in it, has a couple chairs, a desk, a side table. It's, it's very usable. It is a pretty good suite space. And, and with that front window into that garden, for someone, this is going to be a truly excellent option. This is a second bedroom here. Notice two beds uh, and built-ins. Again, very large built-ins. This is kind of a mid... Uh, so the hallway is a little bit narrow, but it's not super narrow. It seems narrower than it is. Uh, bathroom here in the hallway. Good general house bathroom. This would be the one that the guest would use, of course, or, or you'd expect to. Uh, and then we have another bedroom here. So that's three bedrooms on the first floor that we've seen, plus uh, the one bath that is shared and the one that is dedicated to the master. We then have another bathroom here. I was not able to find the light for it, however. It's a kind of a utility bathroom. You would not want guests to go in there, but there is a third bathroom on the first floor. This is a utility space at the back of the house. So this is where the laundry is hanging. It's a little bit of an odd setup, but these stairs were added and a second floor is above. So we have a three bedroom, two and a half bath, we'll call it, on the first floor. And then this little utility space in the back. Um, which this is pretty easy to go up. The stairs were a little bit uneven, but they were pretty good to go up. Um, so all, you know, we hang laundry here. It's just what we do. So that's where this is in this, this house. But this is all open in the back. So there's a lot of ability for air to come through the house, uh, which is important, right? Airflow is the name of the game here. It's, it's the biggest thing in most cases. Very few people are going to seal off their houses. Now, this is a full like in-law suite on the second floor. It's just this space. So it's a good sized bedroom with this little kind of, uh, its own little living room, but a very small space. There are uh, built-ins again. There's the little small, small space that I'm talking about. There's a desk, there's a fridge, then its own bathroom. Um, it's got some nice windows. It is air conditioned. So if you want to keep this air conditioned while the rest of the house is open or whatever, obviously that works really well. You could add air conditioning downstairs. I'm not sure how many of the rooms downstairs are open, but this is the big, this is the big piece. Beautiful outdoor balcony just for this upstairs suite and look at these views just fantastic over on the left is the cathedral and then you can see some of the downtown stuff you can see um the the high school uh la salle uh, a colegio is visible from these windows uh, and then on the right we're going to be able to see the Iglesia Saragossa which is the the church of the barrio here. I was doing my best to try in person it's pretty easy to, to make these things out the camera likes to really grab the the grating it's a little bit hard to see there's some volcanoes over there but but quite hard to see this is a really nice area not huge but but Decently spacious, very easy to sit out, put a couple chairs, have a table. It's a place to eat or have a drink um, on a hot day. It's a great place to get air. I don't have a lot of details on this house as far as what they'd be looking at for selling it or if they're actually interested in selling or not. The idea has come up, but uh, I don't know whether they're really looking to do so or not. So if this is something you're interested in, of course, I'd be happy to pass your information along. As always, I'm not an agent in any way, I'm not representing the house, I'm not selling the house, nothing of the sort, but I'd be happy to uh, uh, pass along contact information. So if people want to make contact, they're able to do so. Uh, but very glad that we were able to do the, the tour thanks to the family who uh, let us do so and reached out and uh, gave us permission and the tour it was very nice getting to see the house and i had a really nice time meeting everyone uh, they all watched the show this is like fantastic right they were watching the show uh, some time ago like a year ago i guess and i did this tour of saragossa and i came past the houses and i made I, I remember specifically making comments about these two houses especially the one from yesterday how big it was i 
just such a beautiful spot. I really wanted to be able to film it and said, someday, Ma, maybe we'll be able to film this. And they watch it. They're like, hey, everybody, we gotta, we're on the show, right? Like, they're showing our house. And everybody's like, what? Uh, and then they reached out, managed to make contact, and were able to see the house. So that was uh, fantastic. It was also very funny. While we were filming yesterday, a friend of mine came around the corner and gave me a hug and, and said hello. And it turns out uh, Ricardo, who was giving me a tour, uh, and my friend had actually gone to high school together. Uh, so, like, great connections um, every which way. All right, so today's question. A number of people have actually asked me this question recently um, in a little different context, but at least three different people have brought this up. And the question is, in a general sense, what is the situation with food handling here in Nicaragua um, and in the region uh, more broadly is, are you really able to eat the food? Is it really a major concern? And we're going to add on the assumed question of how good is the water as people are always like, ah, do I need to filter? Do I need to, what do I need to do? So let's start with the water because that's the easiest one. This is not Mexico. Mexico is the only place in the region that actually has problems with water. You can drink the water anywhere in North America, anywhere in Central America, except for Mexico. I don't know why this is, but Mexico has water problems. It's just a Mexican problem. And as far as I know, it's like every inch of Mexico. I have no idea why. But as soon as you're in Guatemala, as soon as you're in Panama, as soon as you're in the United States, Canada, whatever, the water is drinkable. That doesn't mean it tastes great. doesn't mean you want to drink. It doesn't mean that it's the best, but it is potable. And so you have lots of options. If you're here in Nicaragua, we brush our teeth. We never think twice about it. We cook with the water. We never think twice about it. You don't need special filtered water for everything. It's just, it's not really a thing. And don't bother asking, right? People just don't understand why you're asking so much about filtered water. If you're in really touristy areas, they're a little bit used to it. But for most of us, it's not something we ever think about. So asking, but it'd be the same as asking in the United States, but in the U.S., there's a lot more money to pay for filtration systems. So a lot of people do it just for taste or for looks. You can get clearer water or whatever, and you don't really need to, unless you're in like Flint or, you know, Mississippi. But most of the country has quite good water, and here in Nicaragua, it's basically the same. We can drink it essentially everywhere. The places where you may run into bits of concern, uh, and this is not from uh, foodborne illnesses or whatever in the water, it's that there can be old pipes, especially in colonial areas or uh, in some of the beach zones, where you may be getting contamination from somewhere uh, or you may actually have lead pipes. That can be a risk in some old areas. Those are the things you have to worry about um, potentially. And that's easy to test for if you're going to be living here. If you're just passing through and just having a glass of water, it really does not matter at all. So water is not something we worry about. That said, almost all of us drink bottled water here. Now, this is weird, right? Because we are brushing our teeth, we're showering, we're doing things, we're getting, swallowing the, the tap water all the time. I Not a day goes by. I have not once had a day that I didn't ingest probably quite a bit of tap water that was not treated. Just, and it never once, knock on wood, have I had any uh, uh, water-based illness in any way whatsoever. And back when we lived in Granada a number of years ago, I would drink the water because we would run out of other things. But bottled water tends to taste better, or at least it's perceived to, and people like using bottled water. I don't know if there's any good reason to do so, but we all do. And of course, we're told it's good to support local businesses. I don't know if that really makes sense, but that's what everyone does. So when you're out and about, you tend to buy just normal liter of water or whatever to drink when you're out, and it's relatively cheap. If you're in a home that you're living in all the time, like here, we pay for bottled water delivery, and they bring the big five-gallon uh, water jugs. That was probably ridiculously large they're not that big but they're big and they're heavy uh, and we have um, in the back we have one spot where it's just a open plastic container they cost about $15 there's a stand and you just put the water on top of it and then it's got a spigot and, and you just drink the water from that it's very easy to deal with and then here because we had friends who were moving and they sold it to us used we have one of the fancy units I have no idea who makes it that has straight through water hot water and cold water coming right from us so you don't have to like have a kettle or whatever it's very nice because I like drinking cold water during the day and so I just screwed it from that so I enjoy Enjoy having that. I don't know if I'd spend money on it because I used to just put water in a bottle, throw it in the fridge, like whatever. There's easy way to deal with these problems. But since we got it dirt cheap because they had already bought it and were moving away and had nowhere to, to put it, ah, it's worked out pretty well, I guess. Um, but bottled water uh, is really cheap. I think it's somewhere on the, on the range of like 11 cents per gallon. So I think we pay like 55 cents to have these big water things delivered. Now we pay for the bottles once and then they're, they're recycled. Uh, so they take them back, so you have to keep them. But 55 cents for five gallons, that's why everybody drinks that. Even people who are 
on a pretty tight budget tend to drink bottled water here because it is cheap and that's 55 cents delivered if you went to a distributor and picked it up yourself i guarantee it wouldn't be more than like 45 cents like how could it be um so so having a truck come in and we get like i don't know a dozen at a time uh, because otherwise the, the trip wouldn't be worth it at all they're only getting six seven dollars for for bringing all of that i guess sometimes it may get a little bit more like we may get like 18 20 of them we're pushing towards like into the teens of dollars it's not very much money uh it really is uh, really is a cost effective system um so we have them come like every week in a truck so that's the thing we do so we all do it but we're not worried about the water and if it is a thing where there might be heavy metals in the water then that system does fix that you don't worry about brushing your teeth or whatever because you spit it out most of it it's it's only volume that you worry about not contact whereas if there was a parasite you worry about getting a drop into your system so we're not worried about that we're not worried about parasites with the water what's important with that and the reason i want to mention the water first is because if you're cooking with the water and there's parasites in it like in mexico not all mexico but mostly um if you if you're dealing with Mexican water and you're worried about Montezuma's curse, then if you cook with that water and your cooking process does not adequately uh, kill everything in the water, you can get infected from the food. So that becomes a major food handling issue if you have non-potable water. Here we don't have that problem, so even if you didn't cook properly, the water doesn't end up affecting you via the food that you then eat or via a shower that you take or via brushing your teeth. But when it comes to food handling, it's important that we're talking about cooking. Now, what about food handling itself, ignoring the water situation? Well, I'm going to put it this way. I grew up in the United States in the 1970s and the 1980s when food handling was a lot more sensible than it is today. Today, the United States is crazy and they really don't know anything about how to keep food safe or to cook properly. They, and I'm not saying that they do things dangerously per se, they do things ridiculously. The U.S. is over the top with protections that make no sense and honestly make people sicker. There's reasons, not probably because of food handling things, but there are reasons why people tend to have a lot of illnesses in the United States, a lot of allergies and other things, only in the U.S. and not in other regions. Not that none of those things exist, but the rate at which they exist, the problems with them, the concern about them are completely different in the United States than other places. And a lot of that comes from uh, all the chemicals and treatments and disinfectants and unnecessary chemicals and things that are added or used everywhere. And the U.S. is so into crazy levels of one person once got sick and we perceive maybe it was from this thing. So we're going to make a policy and procedure about this thing. You have to have this ridiculous level of food care that quite simply is just a facade. It does not keep you safe. It is not good. And I've worked in restaurants for a long time including back when it was just starting and now it's completely crazy. So first of all, I just want to give some perspective. This is a sane country and not the U.S. So coming from the U.S., there's so much conditioning that you're supposed to do all this effort for food safety that doesn't actually make sense. Don't get me wrong. You got to wash your hands for sure. You want to make sure that you don't have hair falling into food for sure. You want to make sure that your surfaces are clean, that things hit a certain temperature to cook all the way through. Of course you want to do those things, right? There's things that make sense and there's things that don't. The U.S. tends to be way over the top and impractical. And in some cases, it still is good from a food handling perspective, but it's going to make uh, uh, food cost very, very much higher than necessary and provide effectively no barrier to disease. So it's important to just be practical in these things, right? You don't want to shut out small businesses um, because for a lot of reasons, right? It's not just that you want more variety and you want small businesses to make it and you don't want to limit uh, food preparation to only large businesses, but also small businesses often are going to give you better food quality and large businesses, while they may have lots of written procedures, is also where you end up with a bunch of minimum wage workers who don't care less and skip those procedures and people get really sick. So those procedures only go so far, right? So I just want to give some context here. This is about sensible food preparation, not insane over the top protect from every possible scenario that is not likely to happen. So here overall, my understanding is that, and this is a very broad thing, right? There's, how do you compare countries in food handling? Overall, food handling in Nicaragua seems to be quite good and practical. One of the things that Americans tend to not understand and go a bit crazy about is that here people touch food, just as we always did in America until the 1990s. If you grew up in the U.S. in the 70s and 80s, when people were packaging food, they were touching the food with their hands. This is actually the smart way to handle food. Your hands can easily be cleaned and be cleaned and disinfected many times per day. When I worked in 
medical, uh, <clears throat> when I worked in medical care, we had to do everything with our bare hands because you couldn't use plastic. It just didn't work, you, uh, meaning gloves. You had to disinfect your hands before touching everything. That was for safety. Food prep, because it wasn't a hospital environment, lowered the standard and requ required gloves. So a lot of times on my video, I say a lot of times, when on my video I have shown food prep, one of the things that people comment about is, oh, that's disgusting, I can't believe people are touching the food, they don't have gloves on. But people who know food prep from other countries comment, I don't want people to prep my food with gloves on. Gloves encourage bacteria because people do things like touch surfaces, lay them down, reuse them, touch them against other things, not feel that they've touched things. They don't have the sensory feedback and you can't wash them the way you can wash your skin. And so the reality of gloves, while it sounds great, it's a fake healthcare uh, preventative done to give a facade of being healthy without the reality of being healthy. In real world usage, it's easier and more effective to keep your hands clean than it is to keep gloves clean. If you have a very specific operation happening, for example, an operation, you're a surgeon and you've washed your hands and you're clean-ish, right? And you're about to do something really dangerous. You put on fresh gloves right that second. It's a big procedure. And you do that, and you know those gloves just came out of a factory and have been sealed until you put them on. They're clean. You're already clean. This is extra clean, right? And then you do the thing, and you immediately throw them away. There's no reusing them. There's no washing them. There's no... That's it, right? That's what makes gloves seem clean from a marketing perspective, because the thing that you're doing is... is the procedure that a surgeon takes in order to have clean hands uses gloves and does that. So we perceive the gloves are clean. But when it comes to food prep, we don't do that. And you don't want people doing that. The amount of m waste that we would produce would be really bad for the environment. It'd be terrible for everyone and it would increase the cost of food. It would slow things down, make the food no healthier. It would waste all kinds of plastic. It'd be terrible for the environment. We would just have gloves everywhere. But what you would need to do is you're about to, to package a hamburger for someone. Well, you've been doing other things. Now you're gonna have to go grab gloves, take them out, put on gloves, put a hamburger into a wrapper, put it into a bag, and then, oh, I handed it to someone, I gotta throw off these gloves, now I have to go get new gloves and start over again. That would be insane, but that's what people are picturing is happening. And that's not at all what's happening. What's really happening is people wear the same gloves all day long, and they're itching their face with them, they're scratching their butts with them, they're touching different food with them, they're doing all these gross things that normal people still do with their hands, but they then wash their hands because they're their hands. You wash them all the time. You want to keep yourself from getting dirty, from getting sick, from get what infected or whatever. And so your hands are way more likely to be clean and safe than gloves are in the real world. And that's how real healthcare is done in the real world, not contrived scenarios that don't really play out. When you're talking about hundreds of thousands of, of food production workers in a country, statistics are what matters, not theoretical scenarios. And in the United States, they are simply willing to let you get a little bit more sick more often because they know that neither system is actually that much of a problem. You don't get salmonella that often. It seems like you do, but it just hits the news when it happens. And it seems like a big deal. Generally, it's not. Most people who get things never even get symptoms. So they know that it doesn't actually matter. So they're doing something really impractical just to sell you on it. So. Be aware that when you come here, you're gonna see a lot more manual handling of food, and sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad, but for the most part, the food handling and food cooking is quite good. Also, people don't tend to eat really rare meats here, so the meats have a tendency towards being cooked thoroughly. A lot of things are fried. Frying tends to be really good for killing uh, uh, th bugs and germs and stuff that are on food. So things that you'd be, you know, if salmonella is on a hamburger and you're deep frying it or you're, you know, really cooking it on the grill, you're, you're pretty safe. So we tend to be pretty good here and we don't have um, a tremendous amount of, of uh, interaction on the, on the, the farms, right? There isn't uh, a lot of people going out and a lot of people handling things. And so there's just a little bit less interaction uh, in that way. So we have some benefits in general. Overall, I think food handling here is fine. Um, in all the time I've been here, one of the things that one of the things that does stand out to me in that is that in all the time 
that we've lived here, I've never had someone who I knew firsthand was like a normal, healthy, rational person ever get sick from the food here. That's not to say it doesn't happen, and I only know so many people. And I do think I got a little bit of exposure from, um, I can't remember what it was, I ate something one day, and I did feel just a little bit under the weather, um, and, and I suspected it was from the food handling, but that's like it. Like, it's such a minor thing. People don't sit around talking about all the foodborne illness, illnesses that they're getting. Whereas when I'm in the United States, I still don't get it very often, but once in a while you'll hear someone's like, no, I got food poisoning. It's like a normal thing. And here it is not. People getting sick just doesn't happen as often, it seems. Um, and a lot of people are living in, in much harsher conditions uh, with fewer resources to wash everything, keep it all clean. So uh, I think my impression is that the food handling here is pretty good. I have heard some supposed stories of some rough neighborhoods and going to street food that is incredibly poor neighborhoods, incredibly isolated, uh, and, and getting some low quality food. Totally believable. Like that makes sense. Um, if you're, if you're going for below market price food, somehow they're cutting those corners, cooking faster, cutting corners on, on cleanliness, uh, buying, you know, expired meat, whatever it takes. I don't know. Right. But if you're selling food below the cost, it should be at the grocery store. Something has to give right one way or another. They've either come up with some way to get a food supply that's really cheap that we don't know about, or they're cutting some corner somewhere. So, uh, be aware those things, I guess could happen. I'm, I'm only told that secondhand that it's a, that it's a thing to look out for. I, I believe that it makes sense that it's true, but, um, but that's, that's that kind of information. And especially if you're living here as a tourist or you're living here as an expat, the chances that you're going to go to those places is very low. And if you are going to those places, it's probably because you're dating or married to a, or related to a Nicaraguan and they're taking you to some place, right? And then they probably know that a place is good or bad, or you'll know that it might be something you have to look out for, right? But any normal place, like you really, it's not a big concern. I think you're, you're in really good shape as far as that goes. It's odd because there's just such a different culture of food prep here and the way that it's approached. There's still, you know, they, the, the government still comes in and inspects all the restaurants and, and inspects the grocery stores and does all that kind of stuff. And they have a lot of things that you'd be like, is that really necessary that they still do? So that stuff's still going on. That it's, it's, you're not that it's the Wild West. It's not that you're completely without regulations, but the regulations are just much simpler and more sane here. Um, but I think overall, right, the the idea that you're worried about food prep is so an American thing to have to be concerned about. And even in America, I don't think it's something you have to be concerned about. It's something that we're trained to be concerned about um, because we're, we're so afraid of it. But it is true. In the U.S., there tends to be such a drive for profits that there are corners that often get cut even in pretty decent places. And you will find uh, you know, refrigerators that have never been cleaned or large storage units that, that never turn over or just whatever. And while, of course, that could happen here, um, I think that the the nature of small family owned businesses, there's so many more people taking care in what they do most of the time and, and putting in a more personal effort to more things. Um, I think the nature of the small businesses versus the large businesses, the you're doing it because it's feeding your family and then it's because it's a passion of yours versus you're trying to make as much money as possible and you're always trying to maximize profits um, not to not to make it about capitalism it is not at all like I you know capitalism great yay whatever but it's it's the the nature of many um, American food things especially because chains have become such an important part of American society the idea that you take pride in your work doesn't apply to people who work in chains by and large and I say that as someone who's managed chain restaurants it really is a problem when we did take it take time to take care in our work the company came down and crushed those ideas right we feel like we can do a better job we don't care if you can do a better job but we can do it for less money all we care is that you're following the procedure making it better is not okay right they're very clear about that um, in major chains and it makes sense right i understand they follow procedure because they they don't have the ability to adapt they don't have the ability to leverage doing a good job and that's fine and their things are certainly about maintaining healthcare and everything but um, you could make a better product but that wasn't of concern and you could make fresher product and they'd be like, no, it's fresh enough, but I can make it tastier. No, it's tasty enough. All they cared about was procedure. You have to when you, when you work that way. But what that means is there's never going to be a person working in those environments 
actually takes pride in their work because they can't. There's nothing to take pride in. They're a cog in a machine, they're replaceable by a machine, and they're only not already replaced by machines because the company's getting a tax break by employing someone. And so that's depressing to everybody. It's, in, it's depressing to the employer that there's a tax incentive for not doing the best job. It's, it's depressing to the employee who's doing a job that has no purpose other than to keep them from getting welfare instead, which would have been cheaper and more effective for everybody, but they don't want that, so they give them a tax incentive instead to hide that stuff. Everyone knows that's going on. Everyone who works in that is aware of it, and it is depressing. And that was 20, 30 years ago. Now it's so much more true. It's, it's just, you're not going to get that. In Nicaragua, almost always, you're working or eating food from someone who is specifically identifiable as having made that food. Whether it's the owner or the person working the grill or the person who's serving you the food, it is a much more personal experience. Businesses are much smaller and family owned and, and run by a group of people who, who are proud of where they work, excited to show off where they work, right? I work at this place. I made your food. I served your food. I cleaned the dishes. This is my place. Did you like it? Good, because I did that right? It's a, it's a very different mentality. And I think that alone makes a huge difference, a larger difference than any amount of policies and procedures are going to make uh, in trying to, to make food uh, well prepared to, to keep the environment that it's prepared in clean and so forth. People would be personally uh, hurt if they found out that someone got sick from their food. But if that happened and you were at a McDonald's, the people, you know, the 100 people who work at any given McDonald's would be like, well, who knows whose fault that was and not my problem, I followed procedure, right? If it happens, it happens, right? That, that's the whole thing is there's no responsibility. And so it's a very different, very different atmosphere. And I think that overall, not just in Nicaragua, I've traveled all over the world. And one thing I never worry about, food or water, like those are just not things that come up. When they're going to come up, they're very specific and very acute. In Mexico, you need to be aware that there are water problems. And I get that from people who live in Mexico. People, Mexicans who are born in Mexico are like, we gotta take medicine for this. Like, even though we tried to avoid the water, we got problems. Like we just can't avoid it enough to not have to take medicine for it. Like it's a, it's a real struggle for them. Um, so that, but we all know that Mexico has that problem. If there's a point in the world where you have to deal with water or food issues, they're going to be very specific and very known. And in general senses, you can travel just about everywhere and, and feel confident that food is well prepared in most places. Street food takes on some risk. The things that Americans tend to think are bad for food prep really generally don't matter very much. Uh, and, and in a practical sense, if there is a place that's getting people sick, they're not going to last. Even if the government doesn't shut them down, if inspectors don't shut them down, their customers are going to shut them down. So the only thing I would say to look out for is if you see a restaurant that's full of tourists and not full of locals, yeah, think twice. But as long as you see locals going there, you see repeat customers, and even if tons of expats go with them, a lot of tourists go with them or whatever, that's great. So just as long as locals know that it is a place to eat that tells you that it's safe, it also tells you that it's probably tasty at a good price. And that doesn't mean necessarily that's the best value. Sometimes marketing's going to drive someone to go eat at a place that's not a good value just because, you know, they feel like they should or everybody else is doing it or whatever. But by and large, you know that wherever you go, if a place is busy with the people who live there, that they've probably tried it, they probably have decided it's worth returning and they're not doing that if it's making them sick, or that it's a horrible value or the quality's terrible. So whether you're doing it for food safety or you're just doing it because you're looking for a way to find good food, the practice remains more or less the same. So that's something that's just a good practice to follow. Once you get to know a place, you'll have a better idea of things to be like, well, I know this place is very out of the way and not that many people know about it, but it's completely excellent and you can eat there. But in general, it's not something that you're gonna have to worry about. Multiple people have been asking about that, so wanted to cover it today. And of course, the camera overheats. It always overheats in my last minute of video. Or do I decide to wrap up the video when the camera overheats? Maybe if it gave me a warning, I would time the two a little bit better. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. I hope you enjoyed our tour today. Get down in those comments. Let me know what you want to know more about, what you'd like me to go do, what you'd like to see, all that kind of stuff like and subscribe. I said that. Share on social media. Tell your friends about the show. If you have a moment, go watch another episode that helps me a lot. Just let it run in the background or whatever. Uh, every 
extra viewer, subscriber, all those things that we get makes a huge difference. So I really appreciate all the effort that you guys put into promoting the show. You are the ones who are making it happen far more than anything that I do. So thank you so much for doing that. If you do want to support the show in a more tangible way, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. It means a lot to me when you guys do that. Thank you so much. And I will see all of you tomorrow.